Welcome to Banking 101, a first principle jargon free course on banking. In this lesson, we will round up our discussion of capital markets. We ended the previous lesson with saying that fungibility is the hallmark of capital markets. In this lesson, we will explore why is fungibility important. We will then define the term securities. Then we will dig into the four dimensions of capital allocation. Finally, we will learn the distinction between private and public capital markets. So let's get started. We have a lot to cover. When we look at various asset forms in capital markets, can we define an overarching purpose? The overarching purpose of capital markets is to enable commerce. Commerce is the flow of goods and services of economic value between individuals and entities on a large scale. Capital allocation vehicles allow movement of capital from savers to users of capital, who use the funds to finance investment and consumption expenditures. Foreign exchange markets facilitate cross-border movement of money, either for investment or exports and imports. Derivatives reduce risks of engaging in commerce. For instance, a company that is highly exposed to commodity price risk can hedge its risks with a futures contract. But non-fungible forms of financial assets like loans also promote commerce. So what advantage is conferred by capital markets? The answer is rooted in the property of fungibility. The benefit of fungibility lies in the fact that it increases the number of market participants who can invest in the financial asset. There are three reasons for this. First, investors can tailor their exposure to their needs. A company making an acquisition in Turkey can buy millions of liras. An individual going for a holiday can buy small amounts of lira. Second, a clearly defined unit price helps investors assess whether they are paying too much or too less. Fungible financial assets can either have an absolute price, like the price of a share or a relative price, like the price earnings ratio of a share. The previous two factors create a virtuous cycle. If there are multiple interchangeable units of financial assets floating around among many market participants, bystanders are more likely to jump into the fray. They know that they can sell to other participants if they needed to exit. So, we have now proven that fungibility increases the number of market participants. But why is that a good thing? To illustrate the importance of market participants, consider two scenarios. In the first scenario, a business seeks a loan of $200 million from the bank where it holds a current account. The bank requests for information and after detailed credit analysis, the bank makes the loan. In the second scenario, the business takes the help of an investment bank to issue 200,000 bonds each with a face value of $1,000. In the first scenario, the ultimate sources of capital are the bank's depositors. In the second scenario, anyone, including foreign investors can participate. By sourcing from more market participants, the business can potentially get a more favorable interest rate. To summarize, fungibility leads to a larger number of market participants, which leads to a more efficient outcome. That outcome could be lower cost of capital, a favorable foreign exchange rate or any number of variables. The advantage of capital markets is its ability to deliver efficient outcomes by connecting a larger number of parties than a traditional banking transaction. So why doesn't every transaction occur in capital markets? Capital market participants cannot efficiently gauge the risk of small entities. Only a local banker can understand the risk inherent in one mortgage loan. The local banker knows that, while Peter and Paul both have the same credit score, Peter is an entrepreneur and does not have a stable income source. The risks faced by an individual or a small business is too localized. It is not efficient for thousands of investors across the world to try to assess such risks. It is easier for them to understand large entities that are impacted by macro risks. For example, if one Apple store is not doing well, it does not affect the fortunes of Apple. But a China-US trade war does. There is a way by which the benefits of capital markets can be brought to non-fungible financial assets like a car loan or a mortgage. Consider a bank which makes thousands of mortgages. Based on statistical analysis of past data, the bank estimates 5% of the loans will not be repaid. It doesn't know exactly who will pay and who will not, but the bank has confidence in the model's aggregate results. The bank expects to receive $100 million in principal and $5 million in interest the next year, after taking into account the 5% leakage. It creates a debt instrument with a face value of $1,000 and issues 100,000 of them. This instrument is given the name of mortgage-backed security. The bank sets an interest rate at 5% of the face value of each security. If you bought one security of $1,000, you would get paid $1,000 of principal and $50 of interest at the end of one year. First the bank disperses cash to borrowers. Then, it sells the mortgage-backed securities to investors and thus, recovers the cash it had just lent. The source from which the investors will be paid is the pool of mortgage loans. The investors bear the risk if defaults exceed the 5% estimate. 
This is a simplified version of how a non-fungible form of financial asset on the left, the individual mortgage loan, can be converted to a fungible form on the right, the mortgage-backed security. Next, we will look at the benefits of converting to fungible form to the three parties in our example, the homeowners, the bank and the investors. First, the benefit to homeowners. Without this financial engineering, home buyers would have to rely exclusively on their bank for funding. The bank, in turn, may not be able or willing to fund the growth of its mortgages business. Hence, this connects homeowners to a larger pool of financiers. And as in any other market, a larger number of suppliers means lower prices, in this case, lower interest rates. Further, since investors can sell their slice of the loans anytime, they are willing to accept a lower rate in return for this flexibility. What is the benefit to the bank? The bank earns fees from investors, as compensation for its skill in originating these loans. While it gives up interest income, it can invest the funds in other higher returning financial assets than mortgages. How do investors gain? Obviously, they earn interest. Consider a pension fund that does not want to take risks in the stock markets but parking funds in a bank account is unprofitable. This asset class could give them a higher risk return trade off. Finally, if an investor bought Peter's mortgage loan individually, and Peter defaulted, the investor loses her entire investment. By investing in a pool, risk of individual defaults are diversified away. While capital markets yield great efficiencies, there is greater risk of contagion. In the traditional model, if these mortgage loans default, only the mortgage lender will be affected. But if the mortgage loans were pushed to capital markets through the process we just described, a pension fund investor in another country could be affected. This could then force that pension fund to sell other unrelated financial assets, in a bid to raise cash, which could then initiate a downward spiral in prices of those other financial assets. There are some broad thematic differences between traditional financial services and capital markets transactions. First, traditional financial services is focused on evaluating micro-risks like the risk of theft in a neighborhood. Capital markets are concerned with macro-risks like shifts in government policy. Second, traditional financial services are delivered one unit at a time. One bank account is opened. One credit card is approved. Capital markets enable mass processing because the units are fungible. We buy 1,000 shares or buy call options on hundreds of shares. Third, traditional financial services are focused on building relationships as knowing the other party well is necessary to evaluate micro-risks. Capital markets are focused on building networks to create scale efficiencies. Participants don't need to know each other very well. It is true that in some corners of capital markets, the above generalizations are not true. For example, a startup and a venture capitalist investor would have a deep relationship. However, parts of capital markets that are deeply relationship-based are a relatively small part. This brings us to the end of this section. In the next section, we will learn about securities, a term that is often used within capital markets. Before we dig into securities, let us take a minute to recall our definition of financial assets that we discussed in Lesson 1. We will pause here for a moment and then continue. In the previous lesson, we also learned that financial assets can have multiple expressed forms. Some of these expressed forms are defined as securities. Next, we will learn what securities are. Securities are expressed forms of financial assets that display certain characteristics. First, they must be fungible. The second characteristic is that the relationship between the value of the financial asset and its source of intrinsic value can be explained quantitatively. One and two form a layman's perspective of securities. However, securities also have a regulatory definition, which simply means that the relevant regulator classifies the specific expressed form of financial asset as a security. Since we have already covered fungibility in the previous lesson, next, we will dig deeper into quantitative explainability and regulatory definition. Quantitative explainability simply means that a formulaic representation of Y, the value of the security and the X's, that impact it, is feasible. For example, the value of a stock can be explained as the discounted value of its future earnings. Of course, it is virtually impossible to accurately estimate the future earnings of a company. Hence, quantitative explainability does not mean that the formula can be applied easily or is even very precisely defined. Fungibility and quantitative explainability are characteristics of securities. However, securities have a regulatory definition that may not always be aligned with the layman's definition. Consider the case of an entrepreneur who raises funds through a crowdfunding platform and an exchange, investors get free samples of the product created from the venture. Whether such investments would be defined as securities would vary by regulatory jurisdiction. Understanding the legal definition of securities is outside the scope of this course, as we are only trying to gain an intuitive understanding of this term.
we already know stocks are fungible. In addition, their value can be expressed as the discounted value of future earnings. Finally, regulators classify stocks as securities. Bonds are fungible, as we saw in the previous lesson. The value of a bond is derived from the cash flows of principal and interest expected in the future and the yield that investors demand at any point during its life. Next, we will review a couple of more complex examples. Derivatives are an interesting category. Consider a currency futures contract where two parties agree to exchange a specified amount of currency at a specified exchange rate on a specified date. The source of intrinsic value of the futures contract is the deviation between the specified rate and the market exchange rate. The relationship between the value of a currency futures contract and its source of intrinsic value is quantitatively explainable. But not so for currency itself. Hence, currencies are not securities, even though they are fungible, but a currency futures contract is. Another example of securities are ownership interests of investors in funds like private equity, hedge funds and mutual funds. Some examples of financial assets that are not securities include loans and insurance policies. In general, they don't meet the basic fungibility test. Bitcoin meets the fungibility criteria. But just like fiat currency, the relationship between Bitcoin and its source of intrinsic value is not quantitatively explainable. If an asset class is defined as a security, it carries with it specific regulation, for example, a company issuing equity will have a higher burden of mandated regulatory disclosure than if it was taking a loan, because equities are considered securities and loans are not. In most countries, securities have a separate regulator. For example, in the US, securities come under the jurisdiction of the Securities and Exchange Commission, or the SEC. Bonds and syndicated loans are two forms of debt. Consider two scenarios. A corporate entity borrows $1 billion by issuing 200,000 bonds at a face value of 5,000 each. In the second scenario, the company borrows through a syndicated loan. A syndicated loan is a business loan that is so large that it is made by a consortium of lenders, instead of one lender. However, bonds are considered securities while the individual slices of syndicated loans are not. Whether syndicated loans should be considered securities has been litigated. The merits of this issue are outside our scope. But this example illustrates the importance of the regulatory classification to market participants. The process of converting a non-fungible financial asset to a security is called securitization. The resulting security is called asset-backed securities as they are backed by the cash flows arising from a different, and usually non-fungible, financial asset. We already saw the example of residential mortgage loans. Some additional examples are presented here. We now know that financial assets can be securitized. But what about physical assets? Consider a painting that is priced at a million dollars. Few people can buy this and display in their living rooms. However, an entrepreneur buys the painting and creates a financial instrument whose value is derived from the value of the painting. He issues one million such instruments at one dollar each. The funds, thus raised, finances the purchase of the painting. The entrepreneur keeps the painting in custody of a museum and establishes a rule that every six months, an art expert will appraise its value. If the appraiser values the painting at greater than $1 million, the price of the fractional shares rise and vice versa. People now start trading these fractional ownerships on a web platform based on the latest available appraisal value. So now these financial instruments are fungible and their value can be explained through a formulaic representation. At this point, the regulator comes in and says that the fractional ownership shares of the painting are securities. The physical asset, the painting, is not a security but the fractional shares are. In the previous lesson we learned that the financial assets traded in capital markets are of three types. In this section, we will do a deeper dive on the first category of capital allocation vehicles. Specifically, we will deconstruct the four dimensions of capital allocation. Capital allocation can be understood in four dimensions. The first dimension refers the entities whose savings are being invested. The second dimension refers to capital allocators making the investment decisions. The third dimension refers to the users of capital. The final dimension is the asset class, the form in which capital is allocated. Next, we'll look at each one. Savings generators are the primordial source of funds. They could be individuals, operating businesses, governments and not-for-profits who generate surpluses that are invested. Government entities include federal, state and local governments, and supranational organizations like the United Nations. Deployers of capital decide where to invest. There are three subcategories of capital deployers. First, are the savings generators themselves. We can refer to them as principals. The second and third are savings intermediaries and professional managers. They are both investing other people's money. 
However, savings intermediaries like insurance companies, pension funds, and banks, take ownership of funds on their own books. They are principal intermediaries. Professional money managers are agent intermediaries. They act as agents for the principals and do not assume the risk on their own books. Click next to learn more about each of them. Savings generators can make capital allocation decision themselves. Think of a retail investor who invests in stocks of individual companies or a high net worth angel investor in a startup. Businesses, like individuals, also generate surpluses and they may invest either tactically or strategically. In fact, some corporates have venture capital arms that directly invest in disruptive companies within their own industry. Governments and government-owned entities also make investment decisions with surpluses they generate. Some have specialized investment arms in the form of sovereign wealth funds. Not-for-profits may have investment offices that are investing, at least a part of their endowment, themselves, though they also use professional money managers. Savings intermediaries pool savings of savings generators and invest those savings. The intermediaries assume the ownership of savings on their own books, with a corresponding obligation to pay back savers in the form of deposit repayments, interest payments, claim payouts and pension payments. To generate returns, these firms invest in capital markets. A large part of bank deposits is invested in lower-risk debt securities via capital and money markets. Unlike banks, which are dependent on deposits that can be withdrawn easily, insurance companies and pension funds have access to long-term funds. Hence, they can invest in financial assets that can yield returns over a longer duration, like corporate bonds and equities. There are many reasons, savings generators and savings intermediaries may not want to allocate capital themselves. They may not have the expertise. They also may not have the operational ability to invest the way they want. Say I want to invest in the stocks of the largest 500 companies of the United States in a way that every company I hold is in proportion to its size. A professional money manager has the technology tools to create a mutual fund which does precisely that. We can group professional money managers into two categories. The first group consisting of venture capital, private equity and hedge funds tend to invest in a less diversified asset portfolio. Generalist asset managers invest across the whole spectrum of assets, from high risk to low risk. VC, PE and hedge funds are similar to mutual funds but they invest in riskier assets and are accessible mostly to institutional and high net worth investors. Venture capital funds specialize in investing in startups. Private equity funds invest in mature businesses whose equity is often not tradable by the general public. The term hedge funds is used because these firms originally deployed trading strategies to gain from falling equity prices. Hence, they were hedging against a bear market. But today they invest in a wide array of assets. As such, they are more focused on publicly traded financial assets as compared to VC and PE firms. The distinctions between entities have blurred over time. It is possible for venture capital firms to remain invested in companies long after their IPO, while private equity funds may invest in startups and publicly traded companies. We now know who is allocating capital. So, who is using capital? The users in capital markets could be startups, established businesses, not-for-profits, governments and supranational organizations like the World Health Organization. One commonality between not-for-profits, governments and supranational organizations is that they cannot have owners, so they cannot raise equity. They can only raise debt. The fourth dimension of capital allocation is the type of financial asset being traded. The sources and users of capital are the who of the two sides of a capital allocation transaction. The asset class is the what. Capital allocation instruments can be divided into equity, debt and real assets. Equity and debt are the biggest instruments of capital allocation. The term fixed income is sometimes used to refer to debt instruments as the income derived from debt is fixed, in the sense that normally, you would get paid back principal and a defined interest rate. Returns from equity, on the other hand, are not fixed at all. Real assets refer to real estate properties owned by investor-owned funds. Professional money managers like private equity can pool capital of multiple investors and buy ownership stakes in real assets ranging from homes to airports. The investors get paid from rent and user charges. Now that we have covered the four dimensions of capital allocation, this is a good time for us to cover a couple of common ways capital markets are categorized. One is primary versus secondary markets. The other is private versus public markets. Next, we will review each one. The term, primary markets, refers to the subset of transactions within capital markets, in which, a financial asset is created for the first time. When a company issues new shares in an IPO, it is primary market. The term, secondary markets, 
refers to the subsequent trades of the original financial asset that was issued in the primary market. When we trade shares of an existing company, it is secondary market. Consider a company that wants to raise capital in the form of equity or debt. It can raise capital from the general public. By general public, we mean the entire universe of prospective investors, ranging from a retail investor to a pension fund. Alternatively, it can raise capital from qualified investors only. By restricting the capital raised to qualified investors only, the issuer can face lower compliance burden. The idea is that wealthy or sophisticated investors can do their own due diligence. As an illustrative example, next we'll learn how qualified investors are defined in the U.S. In the U.S., in response to the stock market crash of 1929, the government passed the Securities Act in 1933 and the Exchange Act in 1934. As per the acts, securities were bifurcated into the two categories of registered and unregistered securities. For securities offered to the general public, the issuer has to register the details of the offering with the Securities and Exchange Commission or the SEC, the regulator of securities in the United States. This came with many compliance burdens. Unregistered securities were those that need not be registered with the SEC as they were only offered to qualified investors. These unregistered securities form the private market. In the United States, the issuer is exempt from registration with the SEC if they raise funds from certain investor categories. These include accredited investors who meet certain income or net worth tests, as well pass a knowledge test. Qualified institutional buyers are institutional investors like pension funds and insurance companies. In recent years, rules have been relaxed to allow companies to tap capital crowdfunding platforms. But there are strict limits on total amount raised as well how much a single investor can invest. There has been a general trend globally to relax the definition of qualified investors to allow retail investors to benefit from the wealth created in the private markets. It is time to get familiar with a couple of terms commonly used within capital markets. In a public offering, securities are issued to the general public, either for the first time through an initial public offering or as follow-on offerings after the IPO. In a private placement, securities are issued only to eligible investors, which reduces the compliance requirements on the issuer. Let us now summarize definitions some key terms related to public and private markets. Public markets refers to parts of capital markets where any investor can trade in the financial asset being traded. Private markets refers to parts of capital markets where only qualified investors can trade in the financial asset being traded. Qualified investors are investors who meet certain criteria set by regulators. Public companies are companies whose shares are open to investment from the general public. Private companies are companies whose shares can only be sold to qualified investors. The term alternative assets refer to assets that trade in private capital markets. Any financial asset outside equities and bonds of public companies are alternatives. Shares traded on an exchange is an example of public capital markets. However, a company may raise equity from the general public without listing on a stock exchange. These are traded over the counter or OTC in short. What this means is that brokers trade on behalf of their clients bilaterally, instead of routing their orders to an exchange. In fact, even a stock listed on an exchange can be traded OTC. Bonds, as an asset class, are not traded on exchanges but traded OTC. Bonds issued to the general public are public capital markets. Hence, exchange-traded markets are only a subset of public capital markets. What matters is not the venue of trading but who is allowed to trade. Private equity refers to equity investment in private companies. Private debt refers to loans made to companies via qualified investors like private equity funds, insurance companies and pension funds. This form of lending is also called direct lending as it bypasses structural intermediation by banks. Private debt can also be issued in form of bonds. Real assets, which we discussed previously, are also part of private markets. We have seen that equity and debt can be raised in either private or public markets. Why would a company choose one over the other? Public markets are far bigger. Companies that want to raise large amounts of funds, tap public markets. Public markets are more liquid. Liquidity refers to the ease of converting a financial asset to cash via a sale. Early stage investors could compel a company to go public to exit their holdings. Employees who have been given stock options may also wish to sell their shares for cash. The disadvantage of accessing public markets is the higher regulatory burden. An issuer that is raising funds only from qualified investors in private markets is exempt from many regulations. Public market investors are often looking for short-term returns and thus, may reduce the strategic flexibility of the company in taking long-term decisions. Finally, 
Companies accessing public markets face litigation risk from security holders, on charges of material misstatements and omissions. We can synthesize our learnings on securities with those on public and private markets in two dimensions. One dimension is whether the financial asset is traded in public or private capital markets. The second dimension is its regulatory designation as a security. The matrix lays out the four possible combinations. This brings to the end of our introduction to capital markets. Before proceeding to the next lesson, review the summing up section. Hope to see you shortly.